Hello everybody and welcome to this Corbel webinar. Today's webinar is entitled Westlife Lessons Learned from Developing a Virtual Research Environment and today's speaker is Chris Morris from Desbury. My name is Natalie from Inspect Eric and I'll be hosting the webinar today and manning the chat functions. I also have Michelle here with me from Envil EBI who's assistant host. Thank you Michelle. Thank you. So as, as usual, this webinar, including the question and answer session at the end, is being recorded and will be made available on the Corbel website for later viewing. If you have any questions for Chris, please write them in the questions window of the GoToWebinar application, as shown here, and we'll pass these questions to Chris at the end. You can add the questions at any time, by the way, um, not just at the end. I'd like to start with a brief introduction of Corbel for those of you who might not be familiar with the project. Corbel is a Horizon 2020, which started in 2015, combining 13 S3 research infrastructures in the biomedical field. Corbel aims to work together to transform understanding of biological mechanisms and to help translate this understanding into medical care. Biomedical research projects are often complex and require a wide range of different technologies and expertise to succeed. Corbel aims to help scientific projects like these, which are often at the interface between different biomedical disciplines, to make it easier to access resources across different research infrastructures. Corbel aims to harmonise access and services, for example, biological and medical technologies, biological samples and data services for complex research projects involving more than one research infrastructure. Our speaker today is Chris Morris. Chris is the deputy group leader of the computational biology group at Desbury Laboratory in the UK. He works on software project management and data analysis, including work for the scientific machine learning group. He's an experienced developer with 25 years experience. And we have a good quote from Chris here, where he says, eventually I realized that coding is not the hardest part of the job. Uh, Chris Morris is the project manager for a project called Westlife, which I'll be talking to you about today. So um, with that, I'll hand over to you, Chris. Uh, thanks, Natalie. And hopefully now you can uh, see my screen, which is showing you a list of the partners in Westlife. Uh, it's a three year project uh, with uh, a total budget of 4 million euros and it finishes at the end of this month. Uh, we've got 10 partners. Uh, so uh, actually by the scale of Horizon 2020 projects, this is a, a medium sized or small one. Here are a couple of structures which uh, were uh, which credit Westlife processing services uh, in the papers that published them. Uh, on the left, uh, there's uh, pseudoposium enriched atypical kinase one, uh, and this stri structure showed a similarity to the Parkinson's disease related kinase uh, pink one uh, for the first time. The structures on the right uh, were uh, docked with Haddock uh, a service supported by Westlife. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is a protein called Syncrip. Uh, as a result of this structure, the N-terminal domain was identified as a sequence-specific RNA binding domain. Uh, it's uh, a part of the phage resistance uh, of uh, a bacterium. Structures like this are becoming increasingly common. Structural biology uh, is uh, adopting harder targets uh, in a variety of ways, larger macromolecular machines and the Nobel Prize for uh, the structure uh, of uh, the translational machinery would be, uh, is the classic example of this. Uh, Structural biologists are beginning to uh, investigate dynamic phenomena. Uh, in order to do this, one experimental method is no longer enough. Uh,
researchers be begin to describe themselves not as a crystallographer or an NMR scientist, but as simply as a structural biologist. Another significant change uh, in the field is the resolution revolution in cryo-electron cryo microscopy uh, that the Falcon detectors, which uh, actually were developed by colleagues of mine here at the uh, STFC, uh, have uh, meant that the best electron microscopy uh, structures are approaching atomic resolution. But along with that, there are tremendous IT challenges from the size of the data and the amount of noise. And uh, structural biologists increasingly inspire that their results uh, are available to, uh, to other biologists, uh, for instance, as an input to systems biology. The graphs that you see on this slide uh, are derived from the PDB. Uh, a query API, which is developed as part of Westlife, makes it possible to uh, obtain statistics like these fairly easily so that you see a, an increasing proportion of structures uh, contain more than one protein species. Uh, that in recent years, an increasing proportion of structures are the more difficult eukaryotic uh, proteins. In the very early years, when there were only a small number of structures in the PDB, there was a high proportion of eukaryotic structures. But that was back in the day when uh, protein, uh, proteins for research were obtained from natural source. Uh, uh, PCR was invented just about as, they, as uh, they'd exhausted the number of proteins that were accessible from, uh, for example, from bodily fluids. And as you see in the last graph, the proportion of membrane protein structures, uh, although small, uh, is uh, tending to grow over time. Uh, back in 2014, uh, I did a survey of the participants in the biennial of Instructs. That's the S3 for Structural Biology, a partner S3 to Elixir. And among the scientists there, we found that uh, most were working on eukaryotic rather than prokaryotic systems, on complexes rather than on single gene project products, that research groups habitually combine uh, a variety of different techniques, and yet uh, that there are significant difficulties. Uh, if you're doing a lot of crystallography, it's well worthwhile to install the CCP4 suite, but if for the first time you're doing SACS, then software installation is a significant uh, overhead. Uh, and that the uh, tools don't play so well together. So this is uh, part of the chat. So Part of the issue here, to some extent, uh, as I said, scientists have identified themselves by the technique they use. I'm an uh, electron microscopist. Uh, to an even greater extent, the software developers who support them have been in, in silos uh, by technique. And so that's uh, part of what we want to change. New algorithms are needed to support hybrid methods. Uh, to combine evidence uh, from different techniques into a single optimization of the structure. New validation methods, how do you assess a structure when someone has says, well, I fitted a crystallographic structure into uh, the envelope determined by electron microscopy. New data management challenges because a single research project can involve visits to experimental facilities uh, across Europe. Uh, new challenges for metadata, the PDB format, uh, which the field traditionally used, simply can't uh, uh, express uh, a structure with millions of atoms in. Uh, if this uh, IT environment is going to uh, be feasible to engage with, uh, scientists certainly don't want to be using uh, multiple user IDs and passwords. Uh, and so here is the range of services which Westlife has, in some cases, developed, in most cases, uh, continue to support and extended. Uh, and they're, they're colored by technique as well as the experimental techniques, there's an increasing importance 
uh, in uh, in modeling methods, uh, predictive methods are uh, becoming useful uh, in the field. We've also joined these services up so that, uh, for example, if you put your experimental data, uh, submit your sub experimental data to the services at CCP4 online, then uh, on the screen which shows your results, there'll be a link you can use to submit them to ARP Warp. And on the results from ARP Warp, there'll be a link that would submit them to PDB Redo. And on the screen from PDB Redo, there'll be a link which will submit them to the uh, display facilities uh, developed uh, in part with Westlife Health, but 3D Bionodes. Some of this uh, uh, is, in some cases, the data files are relatively small, so we can uh, implement these, par uh, these pipelines uh, simply by posting the data to the next service. But in the case of larger uh, files, we need to use the uh, European e-infrastructure data management facilities. Uh, and uh, so we created a service we call the Westlife Virtual Sol Folder, which can do this. Uh, the whole thing would, would uh, be crazy if uh, with each submit you were entering a new password. And so uh, we've implemented single sign-on. Uh, Europe is currently cursed with more single sign-on initiatives than one. Um, but none of them were quite ready uh, in the timescale of Westlife. As I say, we're finishing this month. So we chose technologies that we know would interoperate with the Life Sciences single sign-on initiative of Elixir. Uh, we uh, accept as an identity provider the ARIA service uh, organized by, uh, by Instruct, uh, as well as the uh, EDUGAIN services. Uh, so we've just done the best we can to make a viable interim solution and with, um, with the possibility of future collaboration. Some of the services uh, can be uh, served by a relatively modest cluster, but some of them need a serious compute resource, which is provided by the, today by the EGI and soon uh, 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 that'll become part of the EOSC initiative. So putting that together, this is what we made. So how did this happen? Uh, when Instruct was founded, there were some initial discussions about the computational needs of structural biologists, uh, in the course of which I came to think that integrated structural biology demanded a higher level of integration of the IT facilities than currently existed. Uh, it took several years to get funding for a workshop, but I was able to organize one in 2012 with support from CCAM as well as from CCP4 and, and, and Instruct. And the proceedings of that workshop were uh, published in Acta Crystallographica Part D. As you've seen, uh, uh, I followed up with a survey at the Instruct Biennium in 2014. At the time, there was still no grant call, which was a good match to this project. Uh, a helpful report for the, from the EU Infrastructure Re Reflection Group did point the way uh, towards such calls. Uh, when it says that users need to become much more in directly involved in uh, innovation, um, rather than provide a push. So in 2015, uh, the infra call that year was a good match to uh, the things that structural biology needs. Uh, we were in the unusual position that the case of, for support already existed in writing in, and had been published, in, uh, as I say, in actor Chris D. Uh, so we were able to identify partners and write a pretty strong grant application. In fact, we got, we were marked 14.5 out of 15 by the reviewers. 
one of the special features of the field uh, is that uh, structural biologists are not waiting for computer scientists to tell them how to use computers to write programs for them uh, or to tell them how to manage their data. Uh, the first use of a digital computer uh, was in Dorothy Crowfoot's uh, work on insulin uh, uh, in 1946. Uh, she finally got the structure in 54. And uh, by the time she, read, um, she received the Nobel Prize, she was uh, Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, which may be the name you know her under. Uh, the Protein Data Bank was established to share protein structures in 1971. And uh, as the graph shows, has grown enormously since. So what, um, what lessons does this have for, for people wanting to continue to, to enhance the virtual research environment experienced by structural biologists and people wanting to build them in other fields? Well, first of all, any uh, IT provision must be rooted in an understanding of the context of use. Uh, what is the world like uh, of the researchers who we're trying to serve? We also need to understand the context of work of our fellow developers. There's decades of prior work uh, in structural biology and Westlife is a small part of the community. Uh, this is the contrast, for example, to the very successful work of Phenomenal, which was developing a virtual research environment for metabolomics. Uh, IT in metabolomics is new, uh, and they uh, developed a very well thought out architecture built around microservices and Docker containers. And that's the way you do it now if you were starting from scratch, but we by no means were. Uh, there's enormous value in very large Fortran programs which have been developed over a period of decades. Uh, the larger of these programs includes implemented in Fortran their own custom workflow engine. Common workflow language is a great idea but uh, we're, we're not starting from the beginning. Uh, we can't seriously propose the unbundling of, of major suites of of code. Uh, we can't seriously enforce uh, new data standards. In fact, the great need in structural biology has been from the use of existing standards. Uh, and that's why this pipelining of existing web services uh, was the way to go. Uh, we need to respect the fact that the algorithm development is done in universities by small numbers of, of very able people that that shouldn't change and won't change uh, and interoperation will be a retrofit. When you look at the community there, there's probably around a million life scientists in the world who each use computers. Uh, there's between 100 and 1,000 people who are really on the cutting edge of developing new algorithms. But there's a significant layer in the middle, and you can see them in the CCP4 bulletin board when someone uh, shares a bash script. Uh, these are the scientists who are happy installing Linux on their new laptop. Uh, And they're a valuable part of the community. They are, however, on the whole, uh, masters of 20th century computing methods rather than 21st century ones. And I think that the, the challenge which we didn't complete in Westlife is to open this up. Um, the BioJS is a great idea in this field, so that there's a lot of value to be created by composing existing web services. And quite a lot of this can be done at client side, and so it's not so onerous. Um, I, we noted, I've noted among Westlife developers a certain convergence on Flask. On the whole, scientific programmers nowadays are very comfortable in Python. 
uh, Flask is a, is a lightweight but actually very well designed uh, web application framework designed by people who really understand HTTP. Um, and I think the other part of this picture is that in life sciences we still underuse this, the potential of the semantic web. Uh, I get it that there are some performance challenges but um, those are those are solvable uh, in my opinion. Uh, so um, that's what I had to report and um, I'd welcome comments and questions. Thank you very much Chris. So um, if you've got any questions can I remind you to put your questions in the question section of the GoToWebinar panel. And um, to get us started, we've got two questions already. One question was submitted um, in advance of the webinar. And this question is, are there any statistics on how many researchers are currently using the virtual research environment? Uh, yes. Um, the number I recall is the growth rate that over the three, in each of the three years that we've operated, the growth rate has uh, varied between 25% and 40%. Uh, what we haven't tried to do is, is track that down as a fraction of the community. It's not an easy question to answer how many structural biologists there are, uh, nor do we uh, try and track the number of distinct users. Yeah, seem that this is a problem in many fields, knowing the full size of the field. And the second question I've got here is, you mentioned in your talk different organizations such as Elixir, Instruct, and data repositories such as the PDB. How did Westlife work with these organizations? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I exactly know how we work with them. I know we were successful because uh, our co-authorship statistics are uh, are very favorable. In fact, I could, since you've asked, I'll try and get this up um, while I'm talking. Um, there's a, there's a, what I analyzed our publications by the number of other grants which were credit, which uh, were also credited. Um, and I'll find you that for you in the moment. Um, some of, some of it is my overlap of membership. Um, as uh, I'm sure you experience, um, most PIs in the field will be uh, part of several grants at once. Uh, we also spent a lot of time attending conferences, um, both of the infrastructures and of life sciences grants. So you interacted with them at, at outreach events and you had some kind of overlap in your consortia? with people involved uh, in these organizations, yes. is that what you're saying? Yes, that's right. So actually now on the screen, you can see uh, a list of the European grants, uh, which are co-credited in Westlife publications, um, of which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And national European grants, it's uh, national grants for European holders. It's oh, and some US ones, it's an even longer list. Wow, that's quite impressive. So um, another question, what security issues did you think about during the project? Uh, I do have a backup slide on that. Uh, I, so there's a certain tendency to focus on the use cases of a software, and that's certainly a very important question before you've been writing. Uh, I think it's also important to think on the, about the misuse cases. Um, and one of these for any research environment is the deliberate injection of false data. Uh, this is very rare, but it does happen. Um, you know, PhD students are under very considerable pressures to uh, achieve a positive result. Um, the second is plagiarism, uh, which is undesirable when it's happening merely in academia. In addition, a uh, structural biology project in pr 
progress if it's about drug discovery can have a value of about 10 million euros. Um, there are questions about the AI infrastructure. Uh, you can register for an ORCID with simply a Gmail uh, user ID. I don't feel that's wholly satisfactory even for the main use of ORCIDs. It might, uh, I don't know whether it's ever happened, but I think one day it will, that someone maliciously registers uh, as someone else uh, in ORCID. Um, for some of our computational services, the only reason for a registration is so that we can send you an email of the results. Uh, but ARIA has other requirements. That uh, you put in an application for access to experimental facilities. This eventually leads you to visiting a facility where the, um, the facilities are expensive and uh, misguided experiments can be dangerous. So it's got to link with, uh, it's part of an administrative process in which eventually you present both your, yourself and your passport. Uh, so our work is to e-enable research. As we do that, we, it, it's a useful question. Are you making research misconduct proportionately easier or proportionately harder than doing the right <laughs> thing? Yes, very interesting thought there. Um, we've got another question, actually. Um, what are the plans for sustaining the tools developed by Westlife? Uh, some partners are in a EOSC bid starting in January. Um, many of the tools are developed in university research groups, which have a great commitment to continuing the work. Uh, in the case of uh, the virtual folder that I mentioned, uh, Instruct has taken this on. Um, I don't think they can commit to do that forever, uh, but uh, certainly for an interim period and eventually either this will win new funding or we'll simply have to recognize that uh, the community has spoken and is not using it. It's one or the other. So I'll still be able to use these tools for at least for the foreseeable. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, many, as I say, the majority of them existed before Westlife. Uh, lots of those were were part of WeNMR. Uh, some came from from elsewhere. Um, yes, there's there's substantial reason to believe that these tools uh, will exist. That Westlife is only an episode in their life history. That's good to hear, especially if the project is close to an end. Um, if that's all the questions we've got for now, um, I think I'd like to thank Chris again for a very interesting webinar and lots of interesting lessons learnt. And um, I'd like to remind everybody that we'll keep you updated about future webinars in our series via the webinar page on the Corbel website. If you could move along to the next slide or the previous slide, I'm not sure. Chris. Uh, I think you may so, have a definitive version. No, no, uh, that, that's fine. Um, so we uh, have anything scheduled for the next month, but the following month we will have a webinar. Um, and for more information as it comes in, please check out the webinar page, which the URL is given at the bottom of the slide there. And we'll also be keeping you updated in the Cobble newsletter. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for listening to this webinar. Goodbye, everybody.